Welcome back, everyone, to all the attendees of the uh, Digital Investment Week 2021. Allow me to welcome the moderator for our next session, Professor Harmanda Singh, the founder and chief executive officer of Sledgehammer Communications, Malaysia, Sunil Ambrahat. Over to you, Professor Ham. Thank you, Hazro. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ham, and I thank all of you for joining us today. Welcome to the session at the Malaysia Tech Month 2021, a series of digital and technology keynotes, workshops, and discussion panels. I am honored to moderate this session called Restoring the Soul of Business, Staying Human in the Age of Data. And we have the perfect speaker for this. I'm sure you'll find this session refreshing and inspiring as it steps out of the digital ecosystem for a while and looks at the digital world through a human lens. From a man who has researched and written hundreds of papers about digital. We have two gentlemen joining us today. First, we have Raymond Siva, which you all know, Senior Vice President for Investment and Brand and Chief Marketing Officer of MDEC. He is one of the prime movers of Malaysia Tech Month 2021 and is an industry colleague of mine. Today, he is our host. And this year is also the 25th anniversary of MDEC. So, happy anniversary, Ray. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, today is not about us, but about our very special guest. Both Raymond and I are very excited to be here for the star of the show. Advisor, speaker, educator, Mr. Richard Tobacco-Wala, who joins us live from Chicago. This is probably the first time that Richard is speaking at a Malaysian public event of this scale, even though he has already done so in many countries. So we are privileged to welcome him this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, please permit me to introduce him to you properly. Richard Tobekowala is a globally renowned speaker and best-selling author of Restoring the Soul of Business. Staying human in the age of data. He distilled 40 years of global learning and digital wisdom as a keynote speaker for major firms like Amazon, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Procter and Gamble, Bank of America, Walmart, Heineken, and more. He was named by Business Week as one of the top business leaders for his pioneering innovation. And Time Magazine dubbed him as one of five marketing innovators. He lives in Chicago with his wife. And the Chicago Tribune newspaper calls him marketing's digital provocateur. And I'm sure that you will get a wind of what I mean when he speaks today. Trisha is a senior advisor to the Publicis Group, the world's third largest communication firm with 80,000 employees worldwide and serving most recently as its Chief Growth Officer and Chief Strategist. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard is a futurist and one of the sharpest outspoken media minds of the century. We are honored to have you, sir, with us live from the other side of the world. Good morning from Malaysia and good evening to you in Chicago. I know it's late in the evening and we are all, but we are all looking forward to listening to you. I believe it's about 20 degrees Celsius over there uh, now and about 27 degrees here in Malaysia. So you are in a place that is a little cooler. <laughs> Apart from buying his book online, everybody, you can also subscribe to Richard's writings, free newsletters, which, is, which goes out every week at richard.substack.com. Let me spell it out. That's Richard, R-I-S-H-A-D dot Substack, S-U-B-S-T-A-C-K dot com. It is an amazing reservoir and repository of great work. Ladies and gentlemen, the topic of today's session, restoring the soul of business, staying a human, staying human in the age of data is also the title of his amazing book, which will resonate with you. 
He has written extensively about how the soul of business needs the human touch to differentiate itself in the age of data. I'm really paraphrasing here because I have the author with us today. So no one can explain this better than Richard himself. So on that note, we'd like to invite you to join this conversation. So over to you, Richard Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Raymond, and thank you for everybody who's listening to this or will see this either live or taped. Uh, it's a great pleasure. I have been, the closest I have been in, to Malaysia itself is Singapore, where I have been, you know, quite often. I grew up in India. I've been, you know, around Asia. Um, I'm aware of time differences and it's... Uh, approximately quarter to 10 in the night the day before. And as I remind people is Asia is always ahead. And it's sometimes not always ahead just because that it's ahead because of where it is in longitude. But it's also sometimes ahead because you can see things in Asia that occur before anybody else gets there. So in that way, you know, I feel a little strange uh, speaking to people who are ahead of me about what's ahead of us because you are ahead of me. But with that being said, uh, what I would like to do is over the next 20 minutes, uh, speak a little bit about the key themes of my book as it pertains to this conference, as it pertains to all of the various folks who might be listening to this which can span from business professionals to investors, to students, to media companies. Um, and what is common among all of you all is you all are humans. Um, now, I think most of you all are humans because I was not told if there were any animals or other Martians watching this, but I'm sort of assuming it's all human. And therefore I'm speaking to the human in you rather than the business professional or the Indian or the Singaporean or the Chinese or the Malaysian or the senior leader or the student. Uh, when you scratch below all of that, what you end up with is a person. Uh, and so I'm speaking to the person and I'm a big believer in the digital world. In fact, such a big believer that I began one of the first digital agencies uh, almost 30 years ago. So in 1993, 1994, so that's almost 30 years ago. So I also have an advanced degree in mathematics. I have an MBA in finance, and I have uh, done a lot of work in the world of data. So let's pretend for a second that I know digital, that I know data, and I am not scared of numbers. Just let's pretend for a second. Uh, and with that being said, let me tell you a little bit about data and digital. And I want you to keep this in mind. And remember, I'm pro technology, pro data and pro digital. And I have it experience and expertise. If you look at my website or read my writings, you say, yeah, he's not that dumb. He knows these things. So here are my two statements. Number one, while the world is increasingly digital, data-driven and silicon based, you and I are analog carbon based feeling people. And that will never change. And analog carbon-based feeling people are not logical. Second is data is extremely essential and it is like electricity. It illuminates the way and companies can't operate without electricity. But tell me how many companies today differentiate themselves by saying we use electricity better than some other company. You only talk about how you use electricity and you have electricity if your competitors have coal and candles. But how many companies today 
aren't aware of the importance of data. And so while data is essential, it's not actually differentiating for most companies. It is differentiating for a few, for Google and a few others, but otherwise it's not differentiating. So we are moving into a world where data is important, but is not differentiating. And the world is increasingly silicon and digital based, but we are human carbon based and analog. And you might tell me rubbish, you know, who in the world has Raymond and, you know, Professor Ham brought out here? We are digital. This is a digital conference. This is about technology. And they've got this rubbish person coming and saying rubbish stuff. So I'll ask you a very simple question. <laughs> the question I will ask you is, which of you all in the audience wear a watch? And I'm assuming that most of you all wear a watch. That's not rational. Your phone has a better watch than your watch. Why do you wear a watch? So you've done something that's completely not logical. You could save your money by not having a watch. But more importantly, what is the brand of your watch? If your brand of your watch is anything that is not a Swatch or a Timex or something low priced, then you're doing something also illogical because if you buy expensive watches, they actually don't tell time any better than cheap watches that don't tell time any better than actually your phone. So you've just proved to me that you've made a completely non-data driven decision. You bought a watch to show off. You bought a watch for design. You bought a watch as an investment. What's that? That doesn't seem to be very logical. But as importantly, many of you all are either fathers, mothers, aunts, uncles. And if you're none of those, all of you all are children of somebody. You all have to be children of somebody. You can't say, I'm not an aunt, I'm not an uncle, I'm not a father, I'm not a mother, fine. But you are a children of somebody because otherwise you wouldn't be around. Now just think about whether you've had nieces and nephews or children and what your parents had in doing you. Explain to me what the ROI on children is in a data-driven world. It's not a great investment. And now I ask you to think of the last 10 decisions you've made and truly tell me if any more than three were actually primarily data-driven. I doubt it. And as a result, and even if they were completely data driven, let's say you say, I make all my decisions through data. I run spreadsheets. I do everything through data. Everything is digital. Everything is logical. Outside of the fact that you're lying, but I won't say you're lying. I will tell you this. You should get a job quickly because you're going to be unemployed. Because the more your job is driven primarily by data, the faster you will be replaced by a machine. Because if you are talking computation, machines today can compute better than the best chess players, the best Go players, and they can compute better than you. So be careful if you are data-driven, digital, and technology only, because in effect, you are saying you are irrelevant. So that's just a thought. And you might say, okay, that's interesting. But you built your career on data driven and digital and technology, and you haven't become irrelevant. But I don't know whether I've not become irrelevant. I'm fooling you that I've not become irrelevant. The reason I did not become irrelevant is because I kept in my mind that successful individuals, successful companies, and successful people combine the story and the spreadsheet. If you don't pay attention to the spreadsheet, which is data, technology, and math, you will basically become irrelevant. On the other hand, if you don't pay attention to the story, which is people, feelings, and culture, and values, it won't matter whether you're irrelevant or not irrelevant. You'll just be useless. 
So successful companies combine the two. Let me give you an example. In every industry, there are companies that are very left brain and there are companies that are very right brain and there are companies that manage to combine them together. There is a company in the United States called United Airlines that has gone to bankruptcy three times, three times. And it's been run always by engineers, by mathematicians and logistic experts. People don't like flying United. It's gone into bankruptcy three times. There's another airline called Southwest. Mm. And in Southwest, they sing to you. They have a 1% turnover rate. Until COVID, they had never lost money any one year. They attract talent and people love flying them. United and America and United and Southwest fly the same planes to the same airports under the same rules. How come one one makes money and the other doesn't? It's nothing to do with the math. It's the talent and the culture. And let me tell you, if you don't believe talent and culture matter, if history and learning and human don't matter, then in effect, you are telling me you don't matter. Don't ever let anybody, yourself, your boss, your company saying you don't matter because the only thing that matters is you. Everything else is interesting, but without you, there is nothing. And so I've spent a lot of time in my book and this thought letter that I write, which now is read by 20,000 people, including 250 CEOs. Every week, it's free. You get it to shot.substack.com. Broadly, I cover four topics, and it's six, ten, six to eight minutes of read. And if you don't like what you read each week, I introduce a new artist. So you can see new painters, new photographers, new anything. But I cover four broad questions. And these are the four questions that people ask. What does the future look like and how can I be better prepared? And my belief is the future is global. Here we are global. You're in Malaysia or wherever you are. And I'm here in Chicago. The, and it's, it's global with an Asian flavor. It's not, not, you know, you have like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and the Economist getting all worked up about globalization. I said, globalization is fine. It just has an Asian flavor. It's no longer necessarily London, Paris flavored or you know, London, Paris, New York flavored. Yes, London, Paris, New York are important, but you know, so is KL and so is Tokyo and so is Bombay and Shanghai and everybody else. Uh, it soon will be Africa. So it's global. The second is the world is going to be driven by demographics and people forget about demographics. They say, who cares about demographics? We're about technology and data. Not really true. North of you, you've got China. To the west of you, you've got India. What's the difference between those two countries? There's similarities, but they're two big differences. And the difference is, yeah, you could say, you know, they got different governments, they got different things. Uh, common is that they got a billion people plus. But the real big difference between those two countries is one is aging rapidly and one is young. China is aging rapidly. That's why they now say, oh, we made a mistake with this one child policy. And, and because of all kinds of elements of the Chinese economy, including I just read the reason why they banned Dow and EDU and other companies is because parents basically say, we work really hard and we have to spend a whole bunch of money on real estate and education should we actually have children. And so there is a term in China called lie flat, which is banned now, the time lie flat, L-I-E-F-L-A-T, because a lot of people say, maybe we just are better off just lying flat, which is resting, than going on this particular world. India has a different issue, which is what used to be a population problem is now called a demographic dividend. But that means they also have to find jobs for millions of people who turn 20, 18 or 21 every year. So it's a very different thing driven on demographics. All over the world, there's a very big difference driven also by 
something called aging. In Japan, in Korea, both in your neighborhood, the rate of births are about 1.4 to 1.5 per couple, but you need 2.1 births to replicate and keep population stable. So at the current rate, Korea is closing down schools after schools after schools because there's nobody go to go to the schools and Japan will lose a third of its population between now and 2050. And that has massive effect. These are simply aging and population, nothing to do with technology impacting society. So that's the second thing to keep in mind. So I'm now showing you that people and human beings are overwhelming things. People say rational. Okay, interesting. I won't talk about anything excepting that I happen to live in the United States. In the United States, I live in Chicago. A lot of people live in the East Coast and West Coast, like LA and San Francisco and Boston and New York. And they think that I grow cows in Chicago because it's in the Midwest and you know who the hell knows what the Midwest does. It just happens to be the third largest city in the United States. But that mentality that nothing matters with the major urban areas has surprised the United States in two elections already so far. No one could predict the way people were voting because you go one hour outside of cities and people are living a completely different life. Mm -hmm. And this, by the way, is true in every single country in the world. That's true. But most people in the technology business, most people in the advertising business, most people in the marketing business, where do we all live? In the cities. And we miss what actually is happening in the rest of the country. So a lot of what my book basically says is, let's not forget that in the end, it's human beings and not machines talking to machines. So there's globalization, there's demographic shifts, there's obviously technology. I will sort of end this by making some predictions about technology because this is supposed to be, you know, a Malaysia technology month. So I'm gonna give you an idea of where I think technology is going. And if I'm right and you make lots of money, you can send me some money too. But here is where I think technology is going. Technology is going where people want it to go. Technology is not something that is driven by AI. It isn't driven by what Mark Zuckerberg believes. It isn't driven by what Satya Nadella believes. It's actually driven by what you and I believe. And let me explain to you why. In 1993 is when we entered the first connected age. Now, obviously technology has been around since fire, online or the internet's been around since the 60s. But for most of us, uh, the world really changed in 1993 when Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. And then south here of Chicago's cow fields in Alberta, which there is really cow fields, Mark Andreessen created the first browser. And we as human beings did two things. We connected to discover and we connected to transact slash shop. In our business, you know what we call it? Search in e-commerce. But what human beings are doing is we're connecting to discover and transact. The companies that aligned with those human needs in the Western world were called Google and Amazon. The companies that aligned with that in places like China were called Alibaba and Baidu. In 2007, we entered the second connected age, which built on the first connected age. And at this time, people wanted to be connected all the time. We call that mobile, also known as Apple, Samsung. And we wanted to be connected to everybody. We call that social, also known as Facebook, Tencent, Line, whatever. Companies that understood human need for connection and aligned technology for the human need of connection, combining it with simplicity and free prices, because we like value, we like simplicity, and we like connection were the companies that won. Massive companies that did not align with human behavior lost. They could put engineers, they could put anybody that they wanted, but if you didn't align with human behavior, nobody cared. We are now entering the third connected age. So I'm giving you a prediction of the future. So if the first one was where we connected to transact and we connected to discover, which is still going on. And then the second age we connected all the time and we connected to everybody, which is still going on. 
We're now in the third connected age, and this is true everywhere in Asia at different speeds, but there are four forms of connection. The first is data connecting to data, which is really what machine learning is, which is the flavor of AI that works. That's how Amazon can tell you what books you'd like or Netflix can tell you what movie you wanna see. It's simply correlation. It looks at patterns and it basically says, Rishad and the professor both watch this weird show and apparently Raymond watches the same weird shows. So the shows that those two clowns like, he liked too, so we'll recommend this to him. That basically is what machine learning is, very simple. Data connecting to data to write software. The second is much faster forms of connection, which will be coming at different speeds, but it'll be 5G. In Chicago, when you go to the Verizon store using a Verizon phone, right only in the store, the 5G speeds are four gigabytes a second which allows you to download a high definition movie in six seconds. The third is new ways of connecting. Most of us are using voice as an interface. Soon there'll be augmented reality and virtual reality. You know, Mark Zuckerberg is talking about metaverses. And then finally, we're gonna be continuously connected to the great God in the sky called cloud-based computing. There will be quantum-based cloud-based computing. And you might say, what the hell does this mean? I'll tell you what it means. If you have an Amazon Echo device or a Google Home device, it's a third connected age device. It uses machine learning. It's connected to the cloud. It uses voice as an interface. The only thing it doesn't use is 5G, it uses broadband because there isn't enough 5G, but it could use broadband. Now think of a world where every device on you can connect seamlessly at ultra fast speeds to quantum based computers in the sky and you can speak to it or interrelate to it, either through your finger, your voice, augmented reality or virtual reality. And all of this will become real in three years or less at scale. Wow. That is what the future looks like. And I will open it up for conversation. Yes, yes. Thank you, Richard. That was mind blowing. You, you yourself are a mathematician and uh, the way you speak about data itself uh, makes it a very qualified observation. I just want to ask you, some time ago, you had said that, or oh, you have written that uh, mobile was not here yet, so to speak. Mobile was still in its, uh, uh, shall we say infancy, you know, as a platform, as a business, as an as a e-commerce or whatever, as an engine. What are your thoughts about mobile technology in this context? So, you know, in effect, I believe that we are going to very quickly no longer think about mobile technology, search technology, or social technology, because all of them are going to blend seamlessly together into the same thing. So for those of you who have the opportunity to buy something from Instagram or buy something from TikTok. Can you explain to me whether that's above the line, below the line? Can you explain to me whether it's mobile or social or e-commerce? It's all the same thing. I just want stuff and I want it yeah. easy and I don't care. We as an industry have all these definitions and companies. All of those are going to disappear in the next two, three years. I just say, I am God as a human being. You company will have to service me. I'm not servicing you. What are you gonna do about it? And it's the same way like in America, there are a lot of companies because we have more of the vaccine and have things like that. Though of course, you know, there's an entire part of this country that's crazy that refuses to have it, but we still are opened up and everything else. So many of these big companies are saying, you must come back to work five days a week. Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, et cetera. And what they're basically saying is their employees are saying, we'd rather quit than do that. Because humans, once a mind expands, a human mind expands and never goes back. It's like a champagne cork. When it comes out of a bottle, you can't put it in, right? 
It, what has been proven is productivity did not fall off for 18 months where people were working from home. There are lots of benefits of working together, everything from training to community to a whole bunch of stuff. But whoever told you that you have to do that five days a week? You can get those benefits one day a week. You don't have to go to an office museum to get that benefit. You can have an experience by getting the company together in an event somewhere. So the whole idea is all these people are basically saying we are massive new thinkers. I said, why? You're going back to 2019. 2019 is done. It's finished. The way you work is finished. So that's part of what I explained also with mobile is the world moves on and we keep thinking in the past. You know, the sub stack that I write is simply called the future does not fit in the containers of the past. Yeah. The office is a container of the past. Sometimes our mindsets are a container of the past. So, uh, yeah. if, if I may, so yeah. that's really very uh, interesting because, you know, um, innovation and, and technology is really looked at enablers, you know, to, to make humans think better, do things better, and, and, and uh, ostensibly improve our life, right? Uh, so the first yeah. question to you is that, in societies, it seems, uh, at least, uh, you know, uh, generally speaking, that uh, U.S. is a hotbed of innovation and technology. Uh, so from your vantage point, why is that? When societies all over the world, you know, have the same opportunity, the same... Well, okay, when I say opportunity, I mean, you know, to expand, to, to get your mind off the, you know, champagne bottle, right? Uh, in, in a very basic... How is it that that is now a hotbed of innovation and technology really leading the way? Uh, you know, so, many, many things. so there are four reasons why the United States has been a hotbed. And I, I believe it will remain a hotbed, but maybe not as dominant as long as other people understand why it became that. Because so the first one, it was a hotbed because of something that nobody talks about, which is immigration. Mm. Okay. So to give you an idea, 35% of the CEOs of Silicon Valley companies are Asian. CEOs or founders are Asian. So basically the Malaysians and the Chinese and the Indians came to America and they stayed in America because there was immigration. That was number one. Number two, there is something called the rule of the law. So you basically don't suddenly find that your company is banned like Dow or EDU and your stock doesn't fall because your gaming thing is not considered to be a drug. Mm. Uh, so there's rule of law, which is if I've got to build something, but somebody can just say, no, I've decided to change my mind and I lose everything, then investors won't invest. A third is something which is uniquely American. Not uniquely American but it's harder to do this in Asia because I grew up in Asia. And that is the willingness to tolerate failure. Mm. Mm. Okay. And that is something that is very, very important. And mm. then the last one, which is extremely important is the ability to innovation is what I call fresh insightful connections and the ability to bounce off ideas with other people. Right. And Silicon Valley basically had, or different places had a concentration of people playing off ideas in a place where failure was not considered a mark of death, where there was a rule of law so people were willing to invest money, and where you had the world's best talent because of immigration. Now, let me explain to you why that doesn't mean the U.S. necessarily can stay that way and what other countries can do. So the first is the United States, it's changing it, but over the last four years under our previous president was anti-immigration. So that was issue number one. Issue number two is because some of these larger dominant companies in America have basically lost their plot. They, they, they are funded by advertising, but they're really society operating systems. And they run society. And so the government is saying, how the hell did we end up where Zuckerberg decides who gets vaccinated and who doesn't, right? Uh, so, so what basically happens is there's a little bit of a backlash against those companies that might hurt them. Immigration would potentially hurt them. 
And then the other thing to a great extent that might potentially sort of hurt them is the fact that there's actually a new, new way of developing innovation. So I remind people that Linux and a lot of other things have been created in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And as I read somewhere, the next Athens is not a place, it's a space. It's called the cloud. And what will basically happen is, is your country going to allow the people in your countries, any particular country, to have free access to the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. So if you actually have free access to the cloud, you have access to everything. So I'll give you an idea. Everything I do and everything I write is available in the cloud. You go to rishad.substack.com, you get it. When I bought my book, the book that you see in hardcover copy, that is a hardcover copy you can get at Amazon. Or you can go to glose.com, glose.com, and my book is available in the cloud for you to read on any device, any operating system in any country in the world. So I so believe that the future is the cloud. I'm putting all my stuff in the cloud. Yes, I live yeah. in Chicago, but it's the cloud. So I think this, the future is so bright for the world because I truly believe that in many ways, the reason why we're having a lot of the challenges and issues is the ability of technology and human potential has become bigger than government to understand what's happening. Yeah. So government yeah. Well, has fallen behind. I, I must pick up on that. You know, yeah, so, yeah, 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 you first. <laughs> yeah, very quick, very quick. So what we're saying really, uh, Richard, is that we don't need immigration per se anymore, right? We, no, we, we don't. We, 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 see, so now we, we don't need immigration. The, the, the cloud, cloud brings opportunities and jobs to any part in the world. Right. So I'll give you sort of an ex extension. Just think about what we're doing, right? So, so people say, let's go back to work. It's everything else. So I said, okay, let me explain to you. Why do I need to physically move my meat parts when people are only interested in my mental parts? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for instance, what we are doing right now, I'll give you an idea. You and I are talking, right? You're now, most of this audience is in Asia and I'm in North America. Now, let me tell you what my two meetings tomorrow are. So this is an odd one. At five o'clock in the morning tomorrow, my time, I'm interviewing the chief, cre I run a podcast for my old place of work at Publicis. So I'm interviewing the chief global creative officer of Leo Burnett, who's based in London. Mm. So I'm doing an interview where I'm interviewing her and she's in London. And I'm sitting in Chicago and my entire crew is somewhere between London and New York. And we're all getting together and we're putting the show together. Right at 8.15 in the morning, I'm going to be presenting to 400 people at McDonald's across Latin America. Why the hell do I want to go to the office? What are you be talking about? Yeah, yeah. This is your, your whole point about immigration and the whole thing. Yeah, and so yeah. we are about to move into an amazing world. And so yeah. where you are doesn't matter, but as long yeah. as you have the opportunity to learn and that's why a big part of what my book is and a lot of my writing is, is I encourage every individual because I think every individual has, le has leadership potential. Every individual who's listening to this can do amazing things. But yeah. you need one big thing. You need some help, some luck, but there's something else you need. You need to basically put a Bunsen burner under your own butt and basically take charge of your own future and don't delegate yeah. it to somebody else. That's true. That's you know, you know, yeah. Richard, I, I, I'm still coming to grips with something you said earlier, which uh, I'm sure most of the participants feel the same way. By the way, we got a lot of questions from them and we shall sure. share in you know, a while. But, um, you know, that yesterday is gone and tomorrow is tomorrow. I'm still coming to grips with that. Because does that mean that we have to change our mindset accordingly? And we are not ready in that sense. So, no, so remember the four questions that I say I write about and I think about, it's in my book and my writing, is what does the future look like? I've given you some ideas, right? The importance of leadership. But one of the big things I write about is change. Mm -hmm. And I basically say, how do you navigate change? And I start talking about change in a very strange way. So I believe that change sucks. I hate change. And so when people basically tell me, what are you talking about? You've been driving change. 
I said, yeah, I hate change, but irrelevance is worse. Okay, mm. but doesn't mean change is easy. Change itself is difficult. And I remind people that I basically have worked in the same company till I started the second career, but I continue to work with that career for 40 years. Mm. I've lived in the same city for 42 and I met my wife 50 years ago. I hate change. But if anybody comes to you and says change is good, look at them carefully in the face and ask them this. Last time they came to you and they basically said, this bottle of wine is good, they'd say, let's share it. Or if they said, this restaurant is good, they said, let's go to it together. How come when they say change is good, but they want you to do it? Suspicious, right? They're telling you that it's good, but they want you to do it. Every other thing they want to do alongside you. And the reason it's difficult is even if you're young in your career, but many of you all are not only young in your career, if you do change, it's like learning how to cycle or anything else. You fall down, you make a fool of yourself. And the more senior you get in a company, you don't want to be foolish. It reminds, so me, of my, it reminds me of my wife. The change is good. He wants you to do it. <laughs> exactly. They want you to do it. You change. I'm perfectly fine. But my belief, therefore, is for individuals and for companies, I advise them that there's a six pack of change. There's six things you have to do to make change happen. And this is true for an individual or a company, though the first three will sound like it's a company, but it can also be for an individual. One is you have to have a strategy, which is what I call future competitive advantage. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna change to? You gotta know where you're going. You know, you're say, I'm gonna change. Okay, which, well, how are you gonna change? That's one. Number two, you gotta build, you gotta do MA, which is build some new skill sets. And three, you may have to reorganize both the company or reorganize your life. Okay, that's important. Yeah. What people don't remember is why do companies, even though they have good strategy, good reorganization and good M&A fail? Because they don't un un answer four, five and six. And four is, can you explain to me why this change is good for the employees? Number yeah. five is how are the in employees incented to change? So many companies say, you must change, but they give bonuses for doing the same thing and delivering today's numbers. I need to pay my bills. I'm not going to basically do that. I'm going to do this. Yes. It's so incredible. I tell people, show me your incentive plan. I'll show you your behavior. I don't need your goddamn change plan. Just show me how you pay people. That's exactly yes. what people will do. And the last thing is, even if you pay people correctly and you tell them it's good for them, how am I going to do that? Where's your training program? <laughs> Right? So my stuff is show me your incentive program. Show me why it's good for the people. Show me your training program. I'll tell you whether you can change or not. Forget about your strategy and your M&A plan and your reorganization plan. Nothing like that matters. Tell me about these three. If you got yes. these three, then I look at the other three to see if they're right. Yes. Uh, Richard, I'm enjoying this so much and I have so many questions, but I want to be yeah. fair to the participants. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, so I have so many questions from them. And uh, to be fair to them, I will read out all the questions. Okay. Yeah? And then you can try to uh, make notes or sure. answer Perfect. them accordingly. Because uh, one by one, we don't have enough time. Yeah? So one is, how soon will mobile be replaced to a chip inserted or planted in the head of any part of our human body? Uh, another uh, one? Uh, yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Privacy, privacy versus personalization. What is your perspective? Uh, Another one, what is your view on the negative effects of digitalization, uh, data-oriented thinking to society? Another one, cloud technology is not hack-proof. There are still some degree of worrisome that the cloud disappears. What are your thoughts? Another one, how do we rest, uh, what, how do, what is your view on the negative effects of digitalization? Uh, yeah. All, Family, right. Those are the questions. all right, so I'm gonna answer all of the following questions the following way. The, the, the first question that I'm going to basically sort of answer is before there's a mobile chip in your brain or part of your body, there will be a mobile chip in your headphones, on your watch, on your glasses, and in your clothes. Okay. And 3G technology and AI will basically give you that. Then the next thing will basically come, it'll become part of, it's already there as part of your vehicles, part of all your electronics, and then it'll eventually enter your body. 
but it'll be close to things you wear on your body. So it'll look like it feels like it's in your body without them having to go into your body. So that's, that's number one. The idea of privacy, I believe privacy is very important. And I believe the reason why privacy is important is because when somebody is watching, you are not who you are. I'm mm -hmm. just going to leave it at that. Just think about that. When someone says privacy is not important. So I said, okay, I'm going to just watch you all the time. And you're going to say, no, you can't watch me all the time. I said, I thought you didn't care. I just keep watching you. But when somebody is watching you, you are not who you are. And so part of the whole idea is that, which is personalization doesn't require you to take away people's privacy. And the other one is any particular person in two moods is more different than two different people. So don't ever tell me you completely understand me because I purposely changed my behavior because I will not be penned down and put into a box. Okay, this is what a sort of a human, human characteristic is. The question about clouds not hack proof, that's absolutely true. But nothing is hack proof, but people are now figuring out how to do things, you know, better, you know, with, without a doubt that will happen. The downside to society is very, very important. The upside has been people have come out of poverty. You've got amazing things. You can do a lot of stuff. The downside are a lack of trust because you don't know who to trust because you don't know whether it's fake news or real news, which is number one. You have inequality because lots of money goes to the people who run technology and not to the people who work in and around technology. So there's inequality, there's, right? And then the third thing that basically happens is uh, you're also beginning to have polarization, which is people are basically becoming very polarized. So people don't talk to each other because it's like, you know, you wear a turban and I don't, therefore I hate everybody with turbans. Mm -hmm. And you'll say, well, I hate everybody who sits in Chicago in the night with glasses, right? That's not the way to sort of operate, but you know, that's so some of the things. And unfortunately with polarization and with, with inequality and all of these things, the way we can think about it and the recommendation I give people is whenever you are deciding to do something, build a case for why the exact opposite of what you're doing might be true. Because we're living in a world which because of algorithms, I'm gonna use this word, we start to basically believe because we're surrounded by friends who like us, by media that we buy, or media we engage with, or algorithms that make us feel good about ourselves, we begin to begin to believe that our flatulence smells like Chanel 5. <laughs> And it doesn't. Okay. So build a case for the exact opposite, which I think is, you know, one of the key things that basically sort of makes sense uh, as, as, as we go forth into, into the future. So that's about privacy. That's about hack. That's about, um, yes. you know, what might be good or bad. And that's about mobile. I think those are the four questions. Yes. I, I have so many questions, but uh, I did a series of rapid fire questions, but I'll just pick one from there for you. Sure. You know, it's uh, just a question one off because, but give me a very fast answer, yeah? If you had a choice, would you have chosen to live in Singapore or Chicago? Chicago. Ah, the city with soul. <laughs> no, the, 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 yeah, so the, the, I'll tell you the reason is I love Singapore. So it was a tough thing for a second. But the reason I eventually decided Chicago versus Singapore was primarily because Chicago is still trying to figure out what it is and Singapore thinks it already knows what it is. Okay, that's it. And one more, uh, a lot of participants have been asking me this question. So about your unique family surname, Tobacco Wala. Uh, I believe that the uh, family surname indicates your paternal family's roots in the tobacco business. As Walla or Walla, it Hindi means one who performs a specific task. Can you indulge us in, in, in this for a minute, sir? Absolutely. So when the British came to India, many people in India did not have surnames. So they said you need to have a surname. And so it's one of the reasons why and so the Indians said, what the hell is a surname? So they said, I'm a blacksmith, so I'm called Smith. I'm a green grocer, so I'm called Green. And therefore, the two sur surnames you see of Indians are Shah and Patel. One means shopkeeper and one means trader. My ancestors grew and sold tobacco. So that was called Tobacco Walla. A friend of mine 
their family did alcohol. So it's called Daruwala. There is somebody who basically sold screws. And so you'll hear the word screwwala. But this is actually true. In the days before there were openers, there was someone who went around with the contraption opening soda bottles. So I have a friend whose surname is Soda Bottle Opener Wala, and it's true. Very good, very good, very good. Okay, Ray, Ray, your turn. Right, uh, how many minutes do we have? Five? Uh, we have five more minutes, yeah. Just one more question, then, the, uh, yeah. Richard, I, I just want to uh, ask you this. So, you know, I'm really interested with, with you know, where we were and where we can go to. Uh, you know, and, and you've written about it, you've talked about it just yeah. now. So maybe, maybe just to look at the granite ball and, and a more sustainable ball, you know, over crystal. Uh, you, you said it very clearly just now, the machine learning is probably going to take us uh, uh, forward. But also to that point, if we're working off as human beings and not physically connected, so to speak, but connected virtually on a crown, uh, cloud and, you know, trying to get, what does it say about the human soul? So going back to your, your book, right? we, we thrive on, on physical, emotional connections. Can that really be built on the cloud? And, and so where do you see that moving? So the answer is, and what I basically believe is that it is built simultaneously in the physical world and in the cloud. And the reason is, if you look around, right, even if this conference was live and everybody was sitting around, you would see that they liked sitting around, but 75% of the time they were looking at their mobile phone, mm. even when they were sitting next to somebody, mm. right? And, you know, in effect, if you think what makes us human is almost everything we feel, everything we touch, and everything we taste actually takes place here. We think it takes place everywhere else, but it takes place here. And the cloud connects to this, mm. right? So it's sort of a matrix kind of thing. So I believe the future is basically about, that's why it's the story and the spreadsheet. It's how do you combine data-driven silicon objects with analog carbon-based feeling people? It's not either or, but it's together. Right. But to me, the reason why I'm very bullish on technology and data, even though I sometimes say, watch out, and it doesn't go out of control is primarily because it is highly empowering. It enables a lot of people. So uh, in, in, in the, and I will end with this. I try to tell companies and I counsel lots of companies and I basically say, hey, look, ESG is very important, which is environment and social and governance. But there is a new other ESG that's very important. And that's not environment. That's really important. It's the E stands for employee, mm -hmm. which is, can you look, if, you, if your company has employee joy, that company will win because who provides services, who comes up with the ideas, right? So my whole stuff yes. is it's employee joy. And, mm -hmm. and as a result, if you talk to employees, employees say, treat me as an adult and give me choices. Let me find ways to live the way I want to live. So don't tell me that I need to live completely virtually or I need to live completely really. Depending on what I want, let me find ways to combine. As a society, yeah. it's not just social. How do you have society? And then G is governance. So I think we're living in a very fantastic world. And you can read lots more about what I write at rishad.substack.com. Yeah. But the future is really bright. And I'm very bullish for Asia and for everybody. Fantastic. Yes, yes. Thank you, Rishad. Uh, we have about uh, one and a half minutes left. So I will... Uh, I just want to thank you for everything. Uh, it's been thank amazing. Thank you for inviting for me. me and thank you for the audience. And, you know, yes. thank you for Raymond and everybody else at the Malaysian uh, Tech Week month. I will let uh, Raymond do the honors of uh, hosting the session and doing sure. the thank yous. Raymond, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, again, thank you uh, very much, all audiences who've been here today. I think we've gone through a really mind blowing discussion and, and the way Richard has put it into context from where we are, uh, you know, where we come from, where we are, and where we, we, we go to. Uh, I think this this uh, conversation needs to be had more. One hour is certainly not enough. Uh, so firstly, I would like to thank uh, Professor Ham, uh, really, who reached out to, to me and, and you know proposed uh, Richard and, and made this happen. My, my bigger thank you, if you don't mind, Prof, is to Richard to make this time live from Chicago, talking to us here today all across in Asia. Uh, and I think the, the, the insights have been tremendous. Now, uh, for the audiences, this video is available on, on our site. Uh, I, I just want to tell all of you there, this man writes every week and he shares his thoughts with us. So spend the 10 minutes, 
go on to to reach out at substack.com. Please go register and get the thoughts for free. Spend 10 minutes uh, to go inside his brains and, and, and get what's going on. It's not going to hurt you and let your mind come out of the champagne bottle. Right. And one of the key things is the most popular thing I've written, which is appealing to everybody, is 12 career lessons. So after 40 years, I identified 12 lessons. And that has been read by about 300,000 people. So you should look at it. Because in 15 minutes, I teach you more about how to manage your career than almost any career book, and it's free. ESG, employees first. Yes. Right? This, this is going to be critical. On that note, this is not going to be the last. I hope, uh, uh, Richard, Prof, and all the audience, we, we hope to engage with Richard more. Uh, on that note, I, I wish all of you the best of the day ahead. Uh, and for you, a good night, uh, Richard. And Thank may you. we cross paths again in the cloud. Likewise, and wherever, and hopefully once all this COVID is behind us, I will be back physically, and I'd love to visit with all of you all. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Back to Thank you. you again. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Ham, uh, Richard, and Raymond for that thought, mind-provoking conversation. And don't forget to subscribe to that fantastic repository of stories from the man himself from Chicago, Richard at Substack.com. I already did. Yeah. Perfect. So, so yes, so richard.substack.com. Perfect. Richard. Thank you. Substack.com. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful session. All right. Okay. Now, Thank we'll you. moving on, uh, moving forward to our next session of the day. It will begin very shortly. So, attendees, do click join session.